Some of you may know me, I'm uh, part of the research staff here at the uh, School of Mathematics and Physics, and I do a lot of collaborations with the Center for Organic Mechanics and Electronics. I'll be chairing the session today. I'd like to introduce the first speaker, who's uh, Robert McLeod from the University of Boulder, U.S. Um, if any of you have not been to Boulder, I recommend it. It's very pretty. Take it away. It is pretty. Um, all right, well, thank you for the, the few and the, the, the folks that can make it back after lunch. So, I appreciate that. Uh, so let's see. Um, talked about organic uh, uh, materials for creating devices, index devices, etc. Um, and the, one of the themes in any time you're doing device fabrication, optical lithography, is how small you can make things. Because pretty much if it's smaller, it's cooler uh, in lithography. Um, and based on that, uh, about uh, two years ago, a bunch of groups began to look at a particular way uh, to really, really beat uh, the diffraction limit in optics. If you don't remember the diffraction limit, I'll pull the it for you. Uh, turns out they were all inspired uh, by a German researcher uh, who invented a form of microscopy that gets far, far around uh, the similar diffraction limit in detection. Um, and there's now, I'd say, probably 20 or so groups worldwide working on those variations of a, an idea. You can actually implement it in lots of different materials, uh, but the same idea uh, to get well beyond the diffraction limit. Um, and that's, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, so let me define the diffraction limit for you in case you uh, have forgotten. I've picked particular colors and uh, a lens numeric aperture because they're relevant for what I'll do later. Uh, but scale all these things uh, if, if you don't like that color. Um, so if you take a, uh, a lens and you fully fill the aperture of the lens uh, with some laser wavelength and you pick some numerical aperture, this of course is something like a water immersion lens you might, like you might have on a microscope. And whether you're trying to resolve some feature in a microscopic sense, the, 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 the sample is generating light and you're seeing what the point spread function of your microscope, or you're running it backwards um, and you're sending light into the objective and asking what's the smallest resolvable uh, blob of light one can make on the disk, um, uh, there's a limit. And it's, it's proportional to the wavelength and inversely proportional to the NA, and that's about it. Uh, so uh, for blue light, you can get to a little bit under 200 nanometers. Um, a common way to get around this is two photon. And I think either there are or will be some two photon talks at this conference. <laughs> um, however, we have to be a little careful uh, with two photon. Uh, because, for example, uh, most of the time, two-photon uh, responses are very weak, and so you need a lot of photons. Uh, so you might go to a tie sapphire laser uh, that gives you a lot, of, uh, a lot of photons in one short time interval, that of course has 800-ish nanometer wavelength. And so just as a sort of general comparison, if, if, if you have to double the wavelength, uh, then indeed a two-photon response, which is now proportional to intensity squared, uh, it turns out is actually bigger. Uh, than the one photon response uh, because the wavelength change dominates. So you have to be a little careful in just assuming the two photon gives you a smaller response. So if you do two photon at the same color, okay, uh, so here's my one photon response. Uh, now two photon uh, is a little smaller. Uh, it was 188 nanometers, now it's 135. Which is smaller, it's just not a whole lot smaller. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's not that exciting. Um, so let's go back to this chart, which I just stole. I think I've used it three times now in this lecture because I'm lazy. Uh, you can play this game, and if you can get some sort of threshold, you can have a threshold uh, that, that I've been talking about chemically, there's other thresholds you can, you can invoke in lithography. And if you pull your optical exposure, just so it's, just, it's like an island just poking out of the sea, um, then you can make a, a transversely uh, smaller spot. But the penalty is you don't get to do a lot of chemistry, whatever the chemistry is you're doing, uh, in that spot. And as you try to go significantly below the optical diffraction limit, you start losing in a hurry. It's just, it, doesn't, it doesn't work too well. On the other hand, uh, as we've talked about, if you could pattern that threshold so there's, there's no response on axis and just cut off the wings, now you sort of have this idea that you can make this spot arbitrarily small and still do lots of chemistry uh, in the center. So I've talked about ways of using a single color to both dig a hole in some sort of inhibition process and then use that same color to do writing there. And that can get you a factor of two, two and a half or so below the diffraction limit, which is okay. Um, 
but not enough to get you a science paper. That's what I put that um, This is another hand, yes. Um, so this is actually the original idea of Stefan Hell, uh, who has his own uh, cast of thousands now working on this microscope. Um, and it's just a darn good idea, it turns out. So what he did is he said, look, let's do standard fluorescence mic microscopy. So we'll excite. Um, and normally now, I now know there's some photochemists in the room, so I'm going to speak very carefully, which is saying to be vague, so I can screw up. Um, but normally, some chemistry would happen, inter-system crossings, etc. A little bit of time delay, uh, and a second dish. Um, and then, the, uh, after falling down uh, a couple energy levels, I would get fluorescence back to uh, something near uh, the ground state. But, I do have a little bit of time between the absorption and the fluorescence event. So what if I came in and I stimulated uh, the fluorescence? But before this uh, happened up here, in that nanosecond, I did something which would chop off, uh, which would get rid of the fluorescence. Now in this particular example, they're showing uh, a process where I'm going to chop off the top and bottom of this beam. Uh, there's a very similar process, uh, you can put them the same together, where I would chop off the edges. Uh, the, the idea is, is I want to not have the whole spot fluoresce. I want to get a smaller region to fluoresce. Because in this case, what I'm detecting uh, is the region from, from which the fluorescence happened. And if I could, if I could make the fluorescence spot like the same size of my laser pointer here, I'd get a lot more resolution out of my fluorescence microscope. And then I would move over the size of my laser, laser pointer spot, and I would do it again, and I could scan and make a super resolution microscope. So what he chose to do that is to uh, use stimulated emission. So we bring in uh, one pulse of light, and it excites uh, the material. But before it fluoresces, I come in with a, with a slightly different color, just a little bit downshifted. Um, and I cause stimulated emission. And I cause that to happen everywhere <coughs> except right in the middle of my excited spot. So the general idea is I'm quenching or getting rid of or destroying the process at the periphery, at the edges. Um, so this is what that confocal standard diffraction limited fluorescence microscope looks like. Um, if I'd like to get more resolution transversely than a confocal microscope gives me, I bring in my excitation, or sorry, my stimulated emission beam in what's called a bottle beam shape. If any of you know optical trapping, you'll recognize the bottle beam. It's just a, I've got a computer generated hologram up here. It puts a null on axis and some light above and below. The other thing I can put here I can do these both at the same time, is a gauss Laguerre or a donut mode that creates a nice bump of light left and right um, and a null one axis. And I can end up making a cage of light, which is very, very strong, that through stimulated emission depletes the fluorescence everywhere except the middle, and I get a smaller response from my microscope. They have now shown five nanometer isotropic point <coughs> spread function from this microscope, and if you can really see up here somewhere, uh, they're operating uh, in the 600 to 700 nanometer excitation range. So they're getting 5 nanometer optical resolution with 700 nanometer light. And that's a pretty exciting comparison. Um, so that inspired a bunch of groups to ask, can we turn it around backwards and do it with lithography? Um, and a lot of lithography is microscopy run backwards, so that seems to make sense. This is a group uh, from Rajesh Menon's group at MIT. Um, his idea, which is very clever, I really like it, um, was to say, let's take, um, we'll have a, a, a normal, this is this a picture of the, the uh, material for the develop, um, we'll have a normal UV sensitive resist down here. The nice thing now is I can use any normal resist I want. Um, but this is the picture of the resist in a scanning electron microscope. We'll cover that, we'll lay onto the top, let's spin onto it, a photochromic layer. This is how photochromic material works, if you've never seen those. Um, it's got two absorption states. There's a sort of, you send the molecule to a, a transformation, uh, so just trans transformation typically. Um, and so if I uh, develop the material, if I hit the material with red light, I absorb into this red absorption line down here. But notice when I go to that state, I also change the absorption in the UV. As a matter of fact, I, let's see, I decrease Yes, I increase, there it is. I increase the absorption in the UV. So I hit it with red light, and that causes the UV absorption to increase. So what I can do is the big blobs left and right here is my red excitation. I can develop on the material a local near-field mask. And it's only in the dark little hole where I have no red light 
does this material stay in its low transmission state? So now if I put some UV light on there, uh, I have a little little hole on the, that photochromic layer, and the UV light only gets down to my UV sensitive uh, photoresist in a little tiny hole where I didn't hit it with red light. So totally different chemistry, but still the same idea, that I'm going to have two colors. One color is going to modulate uh, how the material responds, and in particular, the two responses are opposite. One's trying to make the material go, that's the UV light, and the red light is trying to make the material stop, that is, not let the light through. This is some examples of things they did. Um, and this is, this is really clever because I get to use standard resistance. The only problem with that, two problems, the two problems with this, first of all, the amount of contrast change I get here is not very high. This is absorption, and I'm getting about a factor of three. And as a matter of fact, even when the material is in its off state, when I went out here, this is supposedly uh, opaque, it's actually not very opaque. And that's a problem, because what we'll find out here is it's contrast, which is now going to drive this whole process. If you give me a, and if you can, by the way, I love this. If you were to give me a material which would modulate its contrast arbitrarily, like factor of 20-ish, um, I will give you nearly atomic scale resolution. I mean, this, the, the, the contrast is what drives the resolution of these processes. It's no longer diffraction. Uh, <laughs> this is University of Car Maryland College Park. Um, uh, they were inspired to, to really follow the SCED idea, uh, which was either clever or not, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so they're coming in uh, yeah, um, with a uh, Thai Sapphire pulse here. Uh, they thought, let's, let's, let's get all our, all our toys together. Let's do both two photon excitation and then one photon quenching. That should get us really great resolution. So they bring in a two photon pulse into a dye which would normally fluoresce. Then they come in with somewhere near 800, they tried lots of different colors, and through a process which is probably some, and I'm quoting their paper, so please be nice to me, reverse electron transfer, they're not quite sure what happened, um, they managed to keep that, uh, that dye um, from going on in exciting polarization everywhere except where they hit it uh, with this quenching beam. So it's the same idea, this figure's a little unclear, but again it's, a, it's using this out of plane, uh, let's see if I can see this, um, I've got uh, just the excitation beam, and then if I, yes, it's hard to see, the figure's not too clear. Um, so I'll show you my figures that work there. But, totally different physics, uh, actually closer to the fluorescent physics of the stead microscope, and the idea again is I have one color uh, which starts a process, and then I shape, there's a phase mask which is shaping the beam, I shape some, some uh, periphery of a second color, and I kill the process everywhere except the, 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 the dark center. So here's how we did it. Um, these are the same equations I showed you before, so I won't spend a huge amount of time on them, but I've got excited, we, we decided just to use photopolarization. That's what we do, you know? so if you, if you own a hammer, the world looks like a nail. Um, so we normally would have some light, I'm gonna subscript this now with initiation, because I'm gonna have two colors of light, and it would interact, interact with an initiator to make a radical. Maybe there's a, a, some terminator out here. We've talked about, talked about that. I guess I'm just solving that because uh, I, want to show, I want to drive an equation to do a little bit of algebra. Um, if I generate this terminator with a second color, that's the new thing I'm adding. Before, this was just some chemical species diffused through the material, and I was shaping it by playing with the chemistry. Now, I am going to create this terminator with another color. And as a matter of fact, it's exactly the same chemistry. It's just another radical generating dye. It just turns out that these radicals like those radicals more than they like monomer. And that's just playing with your, your chemical activities, basically. So I generate these radicals, and they eat uh, the initiating radicals until they don't exist, or why they don't exist. And then if they don't exist, if I can create lots of initiator, then it goes off and makes polymer. And what you can find is a really simple little approximated the hell out of it set of equations is that the growth of my initiating radicals will look like the intensity in my initiating color minus some constant, which is all these great constants, times the intensity of this other color. I'll call it the terminating color. This minus sign is the magic. 
turns out. So two photon or other multi-photon approaches tend to take, say I've got one color or one, one of the photons and I have the pattern in the other photon and I multiply those together to find out how my material responds. So for example, if it's the same color, it responds like the intensity squared. And that's going to be that little tiny decrease in size. It turns out it's double patterning, okay, like you see in lithography. So I lay down one pattern and then I add another pattern and I try to get the to above the threshold just where I added one. This gives me a subtractive response. It's one, the pattern in one color minus the pattern in another color. And like 30 seconds of MATLAB plotting will tell you that if you want to make small features, minus signs are the operation you want. That's magic, and I'll show you why. Much, much better than multiplication or addition. So, ah, that's good. So, uh, with that idea, we went out and just dialed up some photochemistry. It turned out it wasn't terrible hard. Um, we're going to take, uh, go find ourselves a photo initiator, in this case, Camp for Conon. Um, like many photo initiators, it has one little resonance left out here in the visible, and then it goes through a depth before it takes off and gets the normal UV absorption. So we'll, we'll, we'll excite out here uh, where it's got this nice resonance where you can hit it, but it gives us this spot in the UV where we can put a second chemical. Uh, this is a uh, sulfur-based, just another uh, uh, radical generator. Turns out it splits right that sulfur sulfur bond. But the radicals that I make here really like to attack those radicals uh, much more than they like to attack the monomer. So in the blue, I can excite my photo initiator, and in the UV, I can excite this second chemical. And because of the two absorption spectrum uh, being pretty much uh, orthogonal, uh, I can control them independently. And I can go off to my uh, infrared spectrometer and make sure that works. So this is conversion of the methacrylate, the, the, the monomer. Um, conversion means turning into polymer. Right? Um, and this is time. And I hit it just with blue light, and I start right there, and there it goes off, and it starts converting. Eventually, I run out of monomers, so that's the saturation. But if I turn on the blue light and the UV simultaneously, now these guys are generating that photo inhibitor, and that shuts the process off. Not completely. There's my contrast again. But, basic idea, in case you've just walked in, for example, um, blue light starts the process. Simultaneous application of blue light and UV light shuts the process down. Right? Now, if this contrast was perfect, uh, I'd be king of the world. Um, instead, it's pretty good, and I can do lots of good stuff. Because you can see, for example, just UV light causes some level of polymerization, because these are radicals. They're just not as good uh, at, at starting polymerization. So what I'd like is both of these curves to be zero. Uh, and they're not, uh, but they're pretty good. So there's a rule, uh, unwritten rule, for any of you that might be thinking about becoming professors. If you do any sort of optical trapping or structure in your matter, you are required, as the first thing you make, to do your own school logo. That is absolutely required. Um, turns out we both have a very well-known football logo and a somewhat boring school logo, so we had to do two. Uh, so what we did is we wanted to prove to ourselves, well, other people, um, that we really had a one photon process here. We could spread the light out of a large area and do mask-based lithography. So we just spun some of this material on a piece of glass, we brought blue light up through the bottom to the piece of glass, which should have polymerized the entire sample. We put a contact mask on, it's black where it was opaque, and we brought UV down from the top. That stops uh, the polymerization. Uh, it's, it's almost in the back. Um, ooh, it's yes, okay. Um, uh, so the UV gets through the mask up here. Um, and the polymerization does not happen, so when we solve the wash, uh, we get rid of this material. So if this process, if this UV had not uh, done its inhibition job, then we would have made solid polymer everywhere. The fact that the UV stopped the polymerization means that it didn't polymerize here, it didn't polymerize in the holes. And so we do the solid wash. Uh, so this is just sort of a proof that unlike two photon, uh, which can also be very really wonderful stuff, you can't spread two photon out because it's proportional to intensity squared. Um, so we can do lithography, you know, mass-based lithography. Not very exciting yet, except just to say hey, you can spread it out. This is the exciting bit. Uh, this is the next slide. So here's my chemistry again. Exciting the initiator in the blue, the inhibitor in the UV. And this is the same data I had before. This shows the rate of polymerization versus when there's constant blue light on versus the amount of UV I put on. And I start out with a lot of UV, a blue polymerization, and I can drive down to about a factor of five. Again, I'd like this to go all the way to zero. Instead, what I got is a contrast of about five when I turned my UV on. So what am I going to do? 
I'm going to bring in a blue diffraction limited spot that would normally create a bit of polymer about the size of the diffraction limit. I'm going to bring on a UV spot simultaneously if there's a donut or a Gaussian beer mode. Now, a nice thing about these modes is this is, this is created by taking a Gaussian beam and illuminating a phase plate that has a 2 pi phase wrap around the origin. Uh, because it's too hot, it goes right back together, it looks invisible. Um, however, Maxwell is somewhat annoyed by phase discontinuities. Um, and the only way he, Maxwell will let you have a discontinuity in the phase, which happens at the, at the, or, at the origin, in the middle, is to set the amplitude equal to zero. This is a topological constraint on the field. And that means that there are really no photons at that center. It's a nice way to create a really dark model. So I put these on simultaneously, and again, minus is the, the fundamental simple model here. The only place polymer can develop is in the dark donut hole. And that's, that's the magic that we want to see happen. So we make ourselves a little dark lithography system again. We got blue light, which is going to excite. We have uh, uh, infrared light, or sorry, uh, ultraviolet light from a uh, argon laser. We'll run up to a computer generated hologram. You can see my extra little fringe sneaking in there so that if I walk around the origin and pick up one fringe, that's my 2 pi phase wrap, and I all have some long wavelength light to know where I am to sense. Uh, this is then what you want to do. This is the same, same plot I had a minute ago, but now I've got depth and radius instead of radius and radius. Um, so this is a Gaussian beam in a normalized system uh, of the uh, rather range in the, the Gaussian waste. This is what that bottle beam looks like sliced transversely. Again, you get that null right down the axis. It's a topological constraint, so it never goes away. If I want to work in 3D and I want to chop off the top and bottom of the beam, I'll use this, this bottle beam. Bottle beam actually gives me some transversal uh, confinement. So this is going to be my one fit parameter, which is going to relate to how much UV light I put on the system. But the neat thing is, is I can just do this little model, begin with this, where does the fraction go? Minus sign. There goes like this minus sign. Um, and so if I take this, Minus the bottle beam, I expect to get confinement just transversely. If I take my Gaussian initiation beam minus the bottle, I get confinement in depth a little bit transversely. And I have two polarizations uh, at hand, so I can actually put them on both simultaneously. And for doing 3D lithography, this is starting to look like a pretty exciting little blob of material response. And by golly, it works. So you take and put, put this on a slide, you do the exposure with both colors simultaneously. Then you move and just write a dot because you're doing the uh, resolution tests. Then uh, you turn up uh, the UV, uh, which is basically increasing beta here, because um, these are kind of normalized intensity profiles. Um, you do it again, and that makes the donut hole smaller. Now, in the stead microscopy case, they can just keep turning up this beam until they run out of laser. And these get a lot of money, so they don't run out of laser soon. Um, here, we can't keep turning this up. For example, I only get a five-fold contrast. It doesn't help. Uh, also, eventually, my UV starts to polarize. So I've got a finite range, again, about a factor of five. But I can turn it up for a while, and as I do that, the spot gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and that's just what the obvious simple-minded model would show you. So we're going to operate at a really pretty low NA here, an easy, easy to build on your table NA, with these sort of long wavelengths. And we can drop. Oh! I'm going to talk about the diffraction moment just a little bit more, and then I can show you how small we can get. Um, you have to get a little careful uh, defining the diffraction limit, and again, it relates to this game you can play with threshold. We have another threshold here, uh, because notice I'm no longer working at the moment in, uh, in resists or, or, or three-dimensional index structures. I'm doing more traditional semiconductor like lithography, where I'm washing away the material which didn't gel, is the formal word. So if I get enough conversion, and create enough bonds between the monomers, then this material will go uh, from a state which is soluble in the solvent to a state which does not wash away. It's gelled and it's insoluble. So I actually have another threshold, and this is extremely well known and a game played all the time, and that's this, how much conversion do I get, this is conversion over here, uh, to get beyond this gelation threshold. And again, I can pull that, ge uh, that gelation threshold up, or equivalently, I can pull my optical exposure down until I get uh, a bump just above the threshold, but then I'm doing lithography and jello again, and that's not so good. So in order to define the width uh, of this feature, which is my diffraction limit, it's actually a function of how much chemistry I've done on axis. So I can go to a little calculation, and the diffraction limit now is a curve, because it's got to depend on how much conversion I have. So this is a normalized variable, no conversion on axis. I can make infinitely small features, which have infinitely little chemistry done. That's not very exciting. 
Um, if I want to do, uh, if I drive the amount of chemistry to go up on axis uh, to, towards uh, large, then my feature also goes large. So this actually is the diffraction limit. It's in units of the Gaussian uh, spot size here. It makes calculations easy. So if I want to have a diffraction, a quote diffraction limit feature of maybe twice the diameter of twice uh, the Gaussian size, then that tells me for a linear material I have sort of 60-70% conversion on axis. Here's two photon at twice the wavelength, two photon to another one, to one so half the wavelength would, would fit right in here. The point is they always have this tendency that as you do more conversion on axis, the feature gets bigger. As you do less conversion, it gets smaller. The technique I'm showing you here doesn't have that characteristic. Uh, once I get out here, I actually never make the feature very big. Um, and if I simply turn my UV light up, the feature gets smaller. So the point is, I get independent control of how much chem chemistry I do on axis and what's the width. And that's a nice thing, actually. I like to have independent control over those things. Okay, so now it is Oh, I can go test that. Um, you can't actually do exactly that experiment, which is really hard. It's hard to actually know how much conversion you did in a 50 nanometer spot. That's a tough thing for the chemists. Um, but what you can do is simply expose for longer and longer. It's got to be at least monotonic. Uh, you get more conversion the longer you expose. And if you just do the sort of initiation only, that would be the linear case, and look at the width of the thing you measure in the microscope. Indeed, it just kind of keeps going up as you expect. And then you turn on this inhibition beam, and it goes up, and it saturates. So it gives you some confidence that it's doing vaguely what it's supposed to be doing. And this is our pretty picture again. So we're at 0.45 NA in the blue. This is the diffraction limited spot by, and by that I mean something that's a radius of W naught, the Gaussian beam radius. And this is your SEM picture of the spots you make on the disk. And it's almost a factor of 10 uh, between those two things. Uh, so that's now a really exciting number. A factor of 10 is enough to, to go work hard uh, in terms of resolution gain. Uh, if you're doing data storage, that's a factor of 100 uh, in terms of aerial density. And if you're doing 3D data storage, that's a factor of 1,000. Um, and that's, that's starting to be exciting numbers, right? Um, yeah. You'd like to know that you really understand what's going on, so you go back and we've got this extremely simple-minded model, which is that we have the blue Gaussian excitation profile, the UV Gauss-Laguerre donut mode, um, and the polymerization should look like the difference of those with one fit parameter, and so you take, take cross-section across your SEM and fit the parameter, and by golly, it looks like it sort of works. Uh, so the dots are the experimental data, and the line is the uh, is the measurement of the SEM. So indeed, it looks like uh, maybe, maybe the model isn't too far off. Okay, so that's, that's sort of step one, is you can now make single little dots, and you can make them well below the diffraction level. However, single little dots uh, aren't in themselves that exciting. Uh, you have to be able to make more complex things, like lines. Um, well, to do that, uh, if I have a picture here, my little spot somewhere, let's see. Um, let's say that when I put both these colors simultaneously on the disk, I left a big, uh, this is a donut, I left a big chocolate smear um, of inhibitor, and it didn't go away. I left my material, and it was, it was inhibited uh, all around the, that, that central region. Then I couldn't move over uh, a small, small diffraction, sub diffraction spot and do it again. So, as a matter of fact, for this to work, the inhibition effect has to go away in the dark really, really fast. So that I can then move over and do it again and draw another plot right there. So in the whole design of the system, you now have to think about not just getting below the diffraction limit, you have to think about time. So we did when we designed the system, and this is the way you start learning about this. This is yet another materials test. This is actually a mechanical tester. It's a nice way to look at the, the properties of these materials dynamically. Um, and we're going to put on blue, starting right here, um, there's a little bit of oxygen inhibition, just like all these radical systems, we overcome that. The material would have normally started developing and the, the mechanical properties changing, and we can talk about what these are, but the, point, the main point is they depend on the conversion. And it sort of would have taken off right here and just gone up. But right as they would have started, we turned on the UV and we stopped it. Then we turn off the UV and it's allowed to develop. Turn on the UV, it slows down. This ratio is that factor of five again. This doesn't go completely flat um, because the contrast is infinite. We turn off the UV, it starts up again. So the reason this happens is the, uh, the uh, inhibiting radicals are designed to be very small. If you break them apart, they do their job, uh, go inhibit things, 
but maybe they never found something to inhibit, so they're still out there being inhibitors. You turn the light off, they find each other, they terminate on each other, they go away again, and they're laying around to be used again the next time. And that's really important if you're going to do more than take single thoughts. So this is some preliminary results, um, you can tell they're a little preliminary because that's ugly, uh, of doing now full three-dimensional <coughs> stereolithography, like the two-photon folks do, uh, with this to prove that this is a transient feature. What we're drawing here is a 100 nanometer diameter, uh, five micron tall wires. Five micron seems short to the graduate student until we realize that five micron and 100 nanometers is an aspect ratio of 50 to 1. And of course, when you do the solvent wash, uh, you've got this little forest of trees and they all blow down in the solvent wash. So instead, you make these little things that we call our very small rabbit skeleton. Um, but you start doing lines here. Um, sorry for the SEM greediness. And we're getting down, uh, including the, the, the gold coating on this, which is 10 nanometers on each side, we're getting something like 50 nanometer uh, gold or sort of polymer lines, and we can scan around continuously. So that means when we scan around, when we move over into the region which just used to be inhibited, it isn't anymore. Uh, and that's really important to do high speed lithography. Okay, so that was all traditional lithography. You, see, you convert the solvent wash, you get rid of what uh, you, you didn't uh, convert. Uh, and there's a big crowd of people who care about that. Uh, I care a lot about these, these index features like I've been showing you, data storage, etc. So could we take this same idea now and get into the three-dimensional control index? And the answer is yes, in the same way we did it before. Why is this like, oh yes. Um, this is exactly the same stuff I had up before, but now I let monitor diffuse in some solid volume. See how easy chemistry is? We just add a return to the equation. Um, so, we're going to initiate, we're going to terminate, but now when we make uh, polymer, we're going to get rid of monomer, and we're going to let monomer diffuse, and that mass transport will give us index. So we just basically take that same chemistry, and we put it in those same rubbery hosts that I passed around the first day, maybe 5-10% uh, of photoactive chemistry, the rest of it is a solid host. So all I do is I add, same thing I did in my last lecture, I've got my blue beam going along here, which uh, is going to try to write index features. Let's go ahead and add a retroreflector that will send some light straight back. And I'll create this itty bitty little light hologram. Not because I actually care that much about data storage, but this is just a neat and easy way to then read out immediately uh, how big a region that I polymerize, uh, because this little guy is reflected in the blue light. So I can now, with a blue confocal microscope, write and then immediately go back and see how big my feature is with and without the UV or under various conditions. Um, so the first thing we got to do is prove that it's working at all. So this is a, uh, again, a DIC, a phase contrast microscope picture. And I just went ahead and wrote little blue dots, and then I turned a Gaussian beam on, not, not a Gauss Laguerre, but a Gaussian in the UV, and I shut them down. So I have sort of proven that my Boltman chemistry works, and that indeed I'm getting diffusion, uh, and I'm making little index blobs. Um, then I can put that retroreflector in the system, and I can uh, write little weak, just change, change, making sure the material is making linear. So in the blue, I can write uh, little weak microholograms and strong microholograms, like little, little index structures like that. When I scan along, I get basically scattered the material, then I hit that little reflector, and I get a bigger reflector. I can do it a bunch of times and look and see I've still got some dirty material, and it's not real ISNR, but it responds. And I can do that a lot. Uh, Again, this is real typical uh, of these materials uh, at the micron scale, as you can see some variations in sensitivity. That's often the case of getting your mixing really, really good. Uh, because you're getting down to the point you're probing them on a fairly fine scale. And if all your initiators and other chemicals aren't really homogenous, uh, you see this sort of slow variation of the sensitivity on the 20, 30 micron scale. But this is the good thing. This is somewhat preliminary, as in three weeks old. Um, this is a depth scan, and what we really care about, this is for, for data storage again, um, in, in these, these disks, like I showed uh, in the morning, uh, I can get a pretty impressive amount of data. For Blu-ray, it's up in the 20-ish gigabytes um, on a single layer. I would like them to do that in many layers of depth, where many equals 100. That would be an exciting number. Well, to do that, I really need to confine in depth my response so that I, uh, I can make 100 layers uh, separated by maybe 10 microns and put them all on a millimeter. A millimeter would be a nice number. It turns out that that's a hard thing to do with linear response. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to make these little micro holograms. Uh, where do you go? This little guy here. 
but I'd like to chop off the response so just nothing happens here and nothing happens there. And I really got just a couple of microns uh, of response, which by the way means I've got a hologram with like that many fringes in it. So it's started to not really be a hologram, but it still reflects. Uh, and I get a little dirt in my material, but this shows it works. So this is, this is the reflection uh, off of that little guy as I scan in depth. This is what I see just with the blue light on. It turns out, and this is asymmetric because we have an aberration in the system. We realized after we rebuilt the system, uh, so we got some spherical left in the system. But this depth of about six microns is the diffraction limited depth of field of my right beam. But then I turn a, a UV bottle beam on, and I chop off this side, and I chop off that side, and my whole response <coughs> drops to the micron to micronish. And that's pretty exciting now for reaching down in depth and doing sub diffraction patterning. So, I have no idea where I went on time, um, but I had two copies of lunch, so probably ahead of schedule. Uh, this is what I told you. You can, and as I said, I showed you at the beginning three different chemistries to implement the same idea. I talked to groups in Europe last week, and I met three more different chemistries. Uh, so the basic idea for this standard inspired lithography, or difference lithography through colors, is that the limit on resolution is not the fraction uh, anymore. And that's an exciting thing to be able to say for linear processes. Now, you go and you do five photon chemistry or something like that, you can, you, know, you can make a very small thing, but you pay for it in sensitivity. Uh, linear processes are nice because they're fast, and that, that allows you to, to exploit that. Um, as you turn up, if you have sort of arbitrary large contrast in your chemistry, you turn up that inhibition, and you can make your feature size arbitrarily small. Microscopists have gone some 10 nanometers with this with an essentially perfect process, so that's a good thing for them. Um, not only, it turns out, are you controlling this shape, or sorry, size, uh, but also the shape, I uh, should have made some cross-sections of this. Um, but basically, similar to the plots I showed earlier, lot yesterday, um, you have no response here, then you have some response. These edges are very sharp. Sharp edges in many lithographic processes are just as important as a small size. You want nothing, and then you want something to happen. That's the so that's engineering in a nutshell, right? Nothing but something on your response. Um, so it turns out you get a really nice sharp edge response from these as well in both 2 and 3D, and that's exciting. Um, and because uh, it's one photon, as I just said, uh, it goes fast. So this is being uh, looked at both for data storage and also for large area lithography, which obviously has to go fast uh, to be cheap. So I think I'm done talking. I just get to listen to other people. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure how things are supposed to be run. It's 15 now, and I know there's a break, so we may have uh, time for a couple questions before we all break. Uh, if anybody has a question, let's do I have a question. Uh, would it be possible to actually combine this approach with uh, multi photon? Yes, absolutely. Because I can see advantages of doing that from the standpoint of your goal, penetrating deep into the sand, you know, into your field, mm -hmm. um, you know, of, uh, say near infrared light wouldn't be as strong as capture it to mm -hmm. propagate it. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you should never use the word trivial because then you find out that it's impossible. Um, but uh, two-photon uh, dyes are almost entirely radical generators. And the, the only magic sauce here is the photo inhibitor. We've swapped out and used different initiators. So you literally should be able to take out the camphor quinone we use, substitute in your two photon initiator, and do exactly the same thing. So uh, I think this is sort of what we were talking about for a moment. But so in this case, what's limiting resolution is the contrast. You yep. Need. So is there a lot of room for improvement in that as far yep. as chemistry? Yeah. Now, it, it, it now becomes chemistry, and that's, that's not trivial, it turns out. Uh, that's hard. Um, and so we've actually tried to synthesize three different photo initiators, and so far they've all failed. Um, more ideas. That's the nice thing about chemistry is you just keep trying, because there's a million different chemicals. Um, but uh, that's the secret sauce. Uh, and that uh, calculations say that if we could take that contrast up from 5 to 10, we could be getting down to the tens of nanometers sort of resolution. Now then we're going to run into some other limit, I'm sure. But at least basically just thinking about the sort of 
shutting one process, process down. That gets you to some really interesting uh, resolutions for what doesn't sound like a too insane requirement of a chemistry a factor of 10 uh, in those rates. And of course, the lithography folks like you to say 10 nanometers. That's an interesting number. I have a question. Um, you mentioned that there's what I was able to pick up, I guess, the, 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 this con the contrast, which seems to be a big issue. Mm -hmm. This depends on, uh, number one, the, uh, sort of the spectral separation of the initiator and the terminator. Yep, that's, uh, that's we haven't hit that particular one yet, but yes, that does. And, and it's also the resolution. I, I mentioned that uh, the sulfur, um, uh, sulfur peroxide. Diethyl peroxide. <coughs> yeah, so that, that's going to split in half. Yep. Right? Yes. And, and they don't turn off immediately. Yeah. So there's actually, uh, it's, it's, I think, as I said to Tony, you know, the, the diffraction is now not our limit. Uh, we know in this particular case, contrast is our limit. But as soon as that's not, then something else we will be. That's the nature of engineering. Um, so I think there's actually a trade off that we're looking at right now is that you really want the, uh, the inhibited radicals to be small to diffuse fast. So in the dark, they find each other, disappear. But then you might also worry that if they diffuse fast, they diffuse into your dark hole and shut the process off. Um, so there's probably another engineering trade-off there. We're looking at some different processes of diuretics. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah, the, the tool. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that uh, the recombination does not depend on the fusion rate. Because I think actually we're going to need to nail the behavior of the not. So more chemistry uh, is, is the answer. Um, but uh, this was actually just done about a year ago, and so we're still we're still learning these things. And uh, in fact, the two photon version of this, I just talked to a group in Germany that's working on that. There's a lot of stuff in here. So I think, I think we're going to see a couple of years of materials work until we figure out sort of what's the best approach uh, on resistance. Yeah, that's a good question. Um,